Hi, everyone. Uh, we've got a number of uh, people registered for this event, so I'm just going to give it a minute to uh, wait for everyone to join and then, and then we'll get started. Hi everybody, for all the new people who have joined in the last few minutes, we're just gonna give it a one more minute before we get started to let other people join. Thank you. Okay, hey, well, welcome uh, to this first uh, session in the Indigenous Data Management uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Lauren Bosk, and I am a uh, Program Officer of Research Partnerships in the University of Winnipeg's Research Office. And I wanted to start today by acknowledging that where I'm uh, located as an uninvited settler in Winnipeg is on the birthplace and homeland of the Métis Nation, Michif and on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Ojibwe, Nahiawak Cree, and Anishinawak Oji Cree people, and a place of importance for the Oyade, Dakota, and Dene Sulane Dene peoples. This is Treaty One territory. I also acknowledge Treaty Three and the Shoal Lake 40 First Nation area, which is where we get our water supply. Finally, I'd like to remind you of the resource connecting us today. Approximately 70% of Manitoba's electricity comes from Nelson River in Northern Manitoba, located in Treaty 5. I do this acknowledgement to commemorate Indigenous people's principal kinship to the land, which has been restricted. The process of land acknowledgements is inspired by the 94 recommended calls to action, which are contained in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's final report. Land acknowledgements are a necessary first step toward honoring the original occupants of a place, and I encourage all of you to learn more about the land that you are situated on. This series is hosted by Kashadage, the Manitoba Network Environment for Indigenous Health Research, or NEAR, based at the University of Winnipeg. Kashadage is founded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and aims to upskill research capacity and infrastructure for Indigenous communities and organizations undertaking health research in Manitoba. Kishadege focuses on promoting Indigenous self-determination in research through the development of community-based research lodges in partnership with five Manitoba Indigenous communities, the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba, the Manitoba Association of Friendship Centers, the Manitoba Inuit Association, the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Centre, and Fearless RT, R2W. Data, and by extension, data management, is really about sharing and protecting stories, both as an institution and through the NEAR program. We want to support Indigenous community partners to ensure they have full ownership over their stories and data. This series, which is hosted by Kashadage and supported by SHRC and the UWinnipeg Library, was built with that in mind, and we hope you will continue to learn alongside us from our presenters throughout the series. Information on upcoming webinars and pre-registration links uh, can be found under the news section of the Manitoba NEAR website, which I'll drop into this chat uh, after my intros, uh, or on the social media, on NEAR's social media platforms. Uh, this live session is recorded and will be made available under resources and webinars of the NEAR website shortly after the presentation. So just before I introduce our presenter today, I just wanted to note some minor housekeeping matters. So the first is that there will be a short post webinar survey. Uh, we would really appreciate you taking the time to complete this. Uh, as alongside this webinar series, we're developing an indigenous community-based RDM or research data management toolkit which we plan to release next year. 
The survey will help inform the development of this toolkit, especially if there are places in the series that we can clarify or expand upon. So please, please take some time to do this survey. Uh, at any point in the presentation, you're welcome to add your questions to the Q&A feature at uh, the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop with Zoom. Um, and following the formal presentation from Jamie, I'll uh, go through the questions and I'll post them to her. We'll also leave some space for you to gather your thoughts and type out your questions after the presentation. So there, you know, you, there won't be any rush for you to do that. So finally, I am now delighted to introduce Jamie Orr, who is the Research Data Management Librarian at the University of Winnipeg. Jamie supports researchers at all stages of the research data life cycle through consultations, events, and training. Her research interests include data management practices, Indigenous data governance, and learner-centered pedagogy in the context of research services. So Jamie, take it away. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, I'll just share my screen and then we can get started. So can everyone, uh, Lauren, you can see my uh, slides on the screen? Great, all right, I'll get started. So um, I just wanted to also say welcome to the first workshop in the Indigenous RDM Research Data Management Workshop Series. Um, and as you're aware, this workshop will be recorded. Um, the next webinar will take place on September 29th and those details will be in the chat. Um, I am Jamie Orr, the Research Data Management Librarian here at the University of Winnipeg. And as the RDM librarian um, at the University of Winnipeg, this webinar and the next are presented from the context of Western institutions, such as granting agencies and post-secondary institutions like the University of Winnipeg. Um, so thank you so much for having me as part of this series. And um, I'd also like to address uh, who this webinar and webinar series is for primarily. Um, that is Indigenous communities and partner organizations undertaking health or related research. Of course, there are other audiences that will also benefit from this series and who are invited and encouraged to attend. So today I'm going to talk to you about research data. I'll, be, I'll start by discussing the colonial historical context of research data and then we'll define data and research data from both a funder and an Indigenous perspective. I'll then talk about some of the specifics with regards to your data, including data types, file formats, as well as some of the activities related to your research data, such as data conversion, uh, file naming and structure, uh, assessing risk level as it relates to the security measures you might take to protect your data. Research data management undoubtedly has a colonial past. Historically, data collected about Indigenous communities has been done through a lack of uh, an inherent lack with a focus on disadvantage, negative stereotyping, and reinforcing systemic oppression. These practices have not always benefited or respected Indigenous rights or interests. The First Nations Inform Information Governance Center's course on the fundamentals of OCAP does an excellent job of highlighting this past and encouraging Indigenous communities to assert control over their data collection processes to change this history moving forward. Indigenous data sovereignty is achieved when Indigenous communities have control, ownership, access, possession, and decision-making power over their data. The OCAP principles um, will be covered more in more detail by Dr. Jennifer Walker uh, on, in one of the next webinars on October 25th. Um, I've linked to various resources throughout my presentation. So as you can see in the gray boxes, the gray box on this slide and in others, um, this one being the fundamentals of OCAP course offered by the First Nations Informa Information Governance Center. So I just wanted to highlight that and um, I'll try um, to put those in the chat at the end of my uh, webinar.
So to start us off, let's look at some definitions of data. The new tri-agency research data management policy, which was released in March 2020, um, defines data as facts, or sorry, 2021, <laughs> defines data as facts, measurements, recordings, records, or observations collected by researchers and others with a minimum of contextual interpretation. So this is obviously a very practical and in some ways limited definition of data. Of course, we can look at defining data from other perspectives, such as the uh, A First Nations uh, perspective. In their 2019 report on First Nations data sovereignty in Canada, the First Nations Information Governance Centre described the intimate relationship and deep connection First Nations have with their information, knowledge, and data, particularly traditional or sacred knowledge, teachings, and ceremonial practices that have been passed down from generations to the next. And this also applies to human biological data and Indigenous peoples' spiritual connection and cultural beliefs related to their DNA and genetic information. So this resource on the slide is an open access book from 2016 out of Australia and New Zealand, which affirms that Indigenous peoples have inherent and inalienable rights relating to the collection ownership and application of data about them and about their life ways and territories. As the first book to focus on Indigenous data sovereignty, it asks, what does data sovereignty mean for Indigenous peoples and how is it being used in their pursuit of self-determination? So another way of thinking about data is to think about the purpose of it. Are you collecting data for research purposes? For Indigenous community uh, organizations and, and research partners, as well as Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars attending this webinar, the answer is most likely yes. Um, so what are research data? The Tri-Agency Research Data Management Policy defines research data as data that are used as primary sources to support technical or scientific inquiry, research scholarship, or creative practice, and then are used as evidence in the research process and or are commonly accepted in the research community as necessary to validate research findings and results. The focus here on data being used as evidence to validate research findings. Again, this is a very practical definition and also perhaps limited. Research data may be for some research organizations more operational in nature or indeed may be used to validate findings. Research data can be digital or non-digital, experimental, observational, operational, processed or repurposed. It can also be third party owned uh, or public sector data. Repurposed data, for example, may not have always existed for the purposes of validating research findings. For example, administrative data or operational data. These types of data exist for functional purposes and may later be used to validate research findings. So I've mentioned the tri-agency research data management policy a few times, um, but what exactly am I referring to? The tri-agencies released a policy that applies to all grant recipients of tri-agency funding and uh, has a couple requirements of those grant recipients, which I'll cover the specifics of in the next webinar. So we'll look at what those uh, specific requirements are. So I'd like to, uh, again, go back to thinking about research data from an Indigenous perspective. I'd like to shout out Kayla Larson, who, was, uh, who will be presenting later in our series, who offered a framework in a past workshop that I attended for thinking about Indigenous data, understood through relationality, which is constituted by our histories, our culturally embodied knowledges, and life force that connect us to our respective lands, our creators, all living entities, and our ancestors. Indigenous data are data involving Indigenous communities, beings, and land, and includes, or can include, data on Indigenous resources, environments, such as land history, geological information, titles, water information, data about Indigenous demographics, uh, or social data, such as legal, health, education, the use of services, and Indigenous created data, 
uh, or data from Indigenous communities, such as traditional cultural data, archives, oral literature, ancestral knowledge, community stories. So um, the resource on this uh, slide is the um, not open access book. Unfortunately, this book is not open access. Sources and Methods in Indigenous Studies, which contains Morton Robertson's chapter on relationality. Um, and if you're interested in this book and you're not a scholar or um, uh, attending the University of Winnipeg, then uh, we can still um, get you access. You just need, you can contact me and we can uh, figure that out. So ownership control, access and possession of data are principles of Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, but what does this look like or mean in practice? Um, when I was thinking about this, I thought that it looks like a deep understanding of the data that you possess and active decision making about how you choose to manage it in a way that benefits you and the community from which it came. So let's think about research data in practice. I realize this isn't the most exciting topic, but it becomes more valuable when you think about it through the lens of Indigenous data sovereignty. We can, think by, we can start by thinking about what makes up research data. Um, and we're talking about research data. We aren't talking about a singular thing. We're talking about something that comes in many different forms as part of many different processes. So first, I think it makes sense to think about research data through the lens of data types. On the slide, you'll see a few examples of data types from audio to geospatial data types. And you might see some examples of the data types that you work with. So we have um, audio recordings, songs and oral histories, interview recordings, performances, photographs, uh, graphics, posters, pamphlets, um, slides and illustrations. Um, you might be working with markup languages or statistical analysis. Qualita qualitative analysis, such as questionnaires and interviews, or geospatial data, um, like maps and satellite imagery, just as some examples. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about the type of data that you work with. So I've um, created a, um, a Padlet, which is sort of a virtual fork board for us to share the types of data that we're working with. Um, so I'll just put that in the chat. So it's a link that I'll ask you uh, while I'm presenting. Um, to click the link um, and then click on the plus sign at the bottom right of the page that appears and type in your response. So what type of data do you work with? Uh, in the subject bar. Um, and then I can come back to that a little later and we can look at um, what types of data uh, those uh, participants that are attending today are working with. Maybe that's spreadsheets, interviews, photographs, surveys, that kind of thing. So another useful way of thinking about research data is to think about the formats of data you work with. Um, so here we have the same list of data types as I had on the previous screen, um, but with some examples of data formats, which you may be familiar with. So when we're talking about audio uh, file formats, we might be talking about WAV files or MP3s or um, uh, certain types of proprietary software formats, like the APE format. Jamie, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, would you be able to just to drop the link for Padlet again into the chat? Um, you might have to choose every one. It might have just accidentally been sent uh, internally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, no problem. I just noticed a few people were missing it. Perfect. Now we see it. Thank you. Sorry. sorry. I'll pause for a moment. So I'll just go back to the um, Padlet instructions. Sorry. There we go. So I put the link now. Everyone should be able to see the link in the chat. Um, so you'll click the link 
uh, you'll click the plus sign at the bottom of the page when the link page a web page opens there's a little plus sign and then you'll type your response in the subject bar and you can list multiple types of data you don't have to create uh, separate notes uh, but you're welcome to kind of do it however you wish uh, but it will create a cork board of um, all the various types of data that that participants are working with. You know what, maybe I'll just open it up and see what we can find. Um, Lauren, do you mind? Can you see the orange screen? Or are we still? No, I think you're just sharing your slides and not the yeah. additional screen. Uh, okay, that's okay. I'll go back to my slide. So back to data formats. Um, again, some examples of data formats uh, um, listed here along with the data types I was discussing earlier. So, um, as you may know, researchers don't always work with the same format of data throughout the research project. So a researcher may collect data in one format, convert it for analysis or manipulation, and convert it again for storage or uh, long-term preservation. The format which research data are originally created in usually depends on how the researcher chooses to collect and analyze the data, um, and sometimes depends on the software or the hardware used. So today I'd like to focus on one aspect of this process, and that is storage preservation and sharing with regards to data format. This is perhaps one of the most important things to consider when thinking about your research data as um, after you've, hi Lauren. <laughs> hi again, sorry, I don't mean to be a pain. Um, but I just wanted to point out uh, some of the folks in the chat are just mentioning that in Padlet, um, it's just the orange screen. There isn't a, a plus sign and we're not sure if it's maybe locked or just hasn't been opened for sharing. Oh, okay, that's helpful. I will take a look. Thanks everyone in, in, in the uh, chat for pointing that out for us. Totally. <laughs> so it should be like a little pink um, uh, circle at the very bottom right, but if it's not there, um, let's just not worry about it. But if you, if I, I seem, it seems to be on my screen, so I'm hoping it works at least for some people. Um, Yeah, there. Are, somebody's asking if we have to sign up for it. I'm also, Jamie, on my screen too. It's not, um, it's just an orange screen. There's uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's, uh, probably not worth troubleshooting. Uh, yeah. So we'll skip this activity. Yeah, apologies, everyone. Sorry, this didn't work. Uh, and thanks for signing up for it. Um, yeah, that's too bad. This would have been cool. Uh, I can also, uh, Jamie, I can suggest too, I know that you are presenting in this series uh, in our next session. So maybe that's something we can include in uh, in next in yeah. the next webinar series session and people can, can interact in that one. Yeah, we can certainly try to follow up on this and see, learn a little bit more about our, our participants and their research data. So I'll Amazing. try to troubleshoot it in the meantime. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I need do cut me off if anything's not working. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Please continue though. I'm going to borrow you, Lauren, for one more moment. Are you seeing data formats 1.0? Yes, it just isn't in the presenter view yet. It's yes. just um, great. It is. Perfect. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so the format which research data are originally created in usually depends on how the researcher chooses to collect or analyze the data and uh, may depend on the software used to um, collect it. Um, so thinking about storage preservation and sharing when it comes to data formats is one of 
the most important things to consider when thinking about research data. As you've put all this work into gathering it or generating the data, and you likely want to store it and preserve it for later, if not for the long term. Um, most researchers would agree that this is an important thing to consider, but it's often uh, forgotten about the choice of data format for storage, preservation, and sharing. So it is recommended that data be converted to or saved in a non-proprietary file format when possible for storage, preservation, and sharing. A non-proprietary format is an open format not tied to any proprietary software. A proprietary format is a file format developed and generated by proprietary software such as Microsoft. Uh, so a proprietary format would be a, a Word document. Reading such formats can usually only be done by that particular software program. For example, Word documents can only be read and edited in Microsoft Word. This makes proprietary formats not ideal for storage, preservation, and sharing, as potential future users might not have access to the proprietary software required to read and interpret the format, nor the version of that software that would be appropriate for reading that format. Um, so as we know, proprietary software like Microsoft um, Suite is often updated on an annual, if not more than that, basis. And so um, their own formats can actually uh, become out of date and uh, incompatible with uh, new uh, versions of their software. Proprietary formats are more likely to age out and be replaced by new software formats and be, can become unreadable. Um, so what can be done? Proprietary formats can be converted to non-proprietary formats. For example, a Word document can be converted to a plain text file or a TXT file. You can see some examples of both on the slides. Uh, so some examples of proprietary being uh, Microsoft uh, or Adobe programs, um, some uh, SPSS or SAS formats, uh, or any, any format generated with a proprietary um, software. Uh, some examples of non-proprietary would include a comma-separated values CSV. So if you're working with an Excel, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, converting that to a CSV file uh, would be good practice for storage and preservation. Um, tab delimited files is another example, plain text file. Of course, I'm not expecting anyone to remember the details of this. So I have uh, included a resource, um, Stanford Library's Guide to File Formats, if you're interested and would like to start thinking about this as it relates to your research data processes. Um, it's a great resource for thinking through uh, what formats you're using for what purposes. And again, I'll, I'll uh, try to throw some of uh, these resources in the chat so that um, you can take a look at them later on. So I mentioned data conversion, converting one file format, for example, a proprietary format to a non-proprietary format. Um, so here's some examples of data conversion that you might be familiar with. Um, manual or auto transcription. So when uh, writing out audiovisual data to text form, uh, digitization is another form of data conversion. Uh, for example, when an analog photograph is scanned to a PDF um, or file saving and export or data translation software. So when you save a Word document to a plain text file or TXT file or a PDF for preservation. When you're converting file formats, there's a couple of things to think about. Check your data for errors or changes that might have been uh, caused in the export process. So sometimes when we're converting a Excel spreadsheet, for example, to a CSV file, um, you might lose some of the formatting. Um, so a good practice is to save your file in the new format, convert it back to its original to see what was lost. So it, did you lose any of that formatting in that process?
Another example, important aspect of research data to consider, um, not just when thinking about storage, preservation, and sharing, but throughout your project is file naming and file structure. Uh, it's something we all do. We all name our files and we all organize them in some way. Um, but thinking a little bit more actively about this and, um, you know, can reap a ton of benefits for you and others who may be working with your data. So how and where are you saving your files? Um, and what does the hierarchy of the file folders look like? Uh, is it easy for you and others to navigate? Can others tell what a file might contain by the way it has been named? Uh, it's very easy to quickly name a, a data file um, and uh, we all do it, but putting a little bit more thought or at least establishing a sort of a, a standard, if you're especially working within a, a, a research organization, can go a long way to making that data um, easy to work with and then also easy to navigate uh, in the long term. Good file names can provide useful cues to the content status and version of a file can uniquely identify a file and can help in classifying and sorting files. <clears throat> so file names should reflect the file content to facilitate searching and discovering edits. File names should be brief but meaningful and should avoid uh, special characters like the ampersand. Um, using hyphens or underscores uh, is useful when separating logical elements uh, instead of using spaces. Computers can be sort of confused by a space in a file name, but by using a hyphen or an underscore, you avoid that uh, issue. The computer will arrange your files character by character, so putting the most important information first, whether that be the, the date or the um, type of, uh, like maybe it reflects the content of the file. And if you are anticipating wanting to find a file by the date, then put the date first. So uh, finally, when using a sequential numbering system, using leading zeros to ensure files are sorted sequentially. Again, I'm not expecting anyone to remember this in detail. So I have um, included the resource, a resource here from Harvard, which is just a great guide to file naming conventions and includes a lot of these tips that you can use, uh, especially when developing a sort of standard approach to um, naming your files. So finally, I wanted to mention one more aspect of research data to consider, and that is the sensitivity level of your data, especially when we're talking about health uh, research and health uh, data or identifiable data. Um, so there's a great resource that exists. It's open and available to the public that helps organizations, groups, and institutions identify the risk level of their data from low to medium to high. Um, it then describes uh, the recommended practice for managing the data um, based on the risk level identified um, and in terms of managing data, I'm referring to how that data is collected, stored, shared, deposited, and then accessed. So I'd like to look at this resource to show you what I mean by this. Um, we can see here on the slide um, how low risk data is defined. So low risk data is defined as data collected with no information that could reasonably identify individuals or groups. Medium risk may contain information originally collected as confidential, private, oh, I have a spelling mistake there, or is sensitive. High risk um, data subject may be vulnerable in the context of research and may be harmed if a breach were to occur. And extreme risk, data contains confidential, private, or sensitive information and data subject would be harmed if a breach were to occur. So it's not only is it important to think about what types of data you're working with, the file formats, um, how you name those file formats, uh, but also how you're protecting the, that data, uh, whether it's high risk or low risk. So um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing and then open up this resource so, so we can take a look at it.
So hopefully everyone can see um, this uh, resource portage, yes, and training resources. So the portage network is a network of research data management experts that have put together a range of uh, resources related to research data management. I'll come back to this in the next webinar, but uh, so this is just a great place to go. Um, if you're uh, new to research data management, um, this is a, a great starting point. Um, under their uh, training resources, they've linked to the sensitive data guidance. And I'm going to just show you the um, sensitive data toolkit part two, the data risk matrix. Okay, so the data uh, risk matrix identifies uh, as I had on the previous screen, um, the risk level of the data from low to extreme. And then um, some advice around how to manage that data uh, based on the risk level. So for example, when it comes to informed consent, if you're working with low risk, um, it's good practice that notification uh, that the researcher notify participants that data will be made available for future use if that's the plan. Whereas with extreme risk data, confidentiality will be maintained for as long as the data exists. Data will not be shared beyond the research team. So it's sort of a recommended uh, practice when um, thinking about informed consent. It also uh, reviews um, recommended practice for data collection um, from low risk to extreme risk uh, and some of the details about uh, what data might be collected and what might not be. Uh, we can also look at data analysis and management. So um, for low risk, no restrictions in the analysis of data for publicly available data. Whereas with extreme risk data, Direct identifiers shall be replaced as soon as possible with a linking code separated physically or electronically from the master list. Consent forms or notes with identifiers shall be destroyed separately from research data. So as an organization um, or researcher working with uh, sensitive data, this is a great place to look for um, developing some processes around how your data might be managed. We also have some guidance around data storage um, and data sharing. So um, how data you know, is shared either over email or over networks or physically shared, that type of thing. And then thinking about data deposit and access, including secondary use. So if you are planning on sharing the data in a repository or an archive of some kind, thinking about its risk level and how that data is stored and accessed. Finally, data retention and destruction. So it's always good to think through the full life cycle of the data, which is something we'll talk about in the next webinar a little bit more in detail. Um, but will the data be uh, retained for how long and will it be destroyed, uh, especially based on the risk level? Let's just a uh, quick introduction to that resource. I'm gonna go back to my screen. So we'll hopefully are back on the slides. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay, so um, hopefully this kind of gave you a good overview of some of the foundational knowledge about the data you work with, some of the things you might consider um, if you haven't already with regards to managing your data in a way that works for you, your organization's team or self. Um, so some questions to consider in the lead up to our next webinar are, uh, what is the function of your data? Um, are you using it creating it and analyzing it, storing it long-term? Do you have administrative, contractual, or policy requirements to retain or share the data? 
Uh, what is the sensitivity level of your data? Do you need to attain informed consent? And what might you include in that informed consent? What data needs to be securely stored? Um, where uh, will you store it? Uh, or where do you currently store it? Um, what data can and should be destroyed and when? Um, and what, if any, data will be shared and with whom? Um, so talk, thinking about whether data will be shared publicly, open access, or just with the community that the data came from or a select uh, group of people or perhaps no one. Um, how will you share your data with the public or with the community if that's the plan? Um, so the next webinar will explore research data management um, a little bit more broadly. We'll think about uh, the full life cycle of research data management. This webinar, we got a little bit into the specifics with regards to your research data. But we'll think about um, the whole life cycle from data collection through to data sharing. We'll also look at the policy landscape in Canada, so including the new tri-agency RDN policy um, and privacy legislation to um, uh, and other and resources that are available, public resources that are available to uh, research organizations who are interested in um, thinking about data management, planning, um, privacy, and that kind of thing. So there's some great resources out there. Um, so I just wanted to point out the next webinar will be on the 29th, I believe. I'll be hosting that webinar. And uh, I wanted to ask if there were any questions or pause. Maybe I'll, I'll leave the screen up for a moment. Uh, my email is there and you're welcome to reach out afterwards if you do have any questions that you think of later or would prefer to just ask me directly. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jamie. I, uh, there's a couple of questions I have already sent in um, and I want to encourage everyone, if you have any questions to use the Q&A uh, function and uh, drop your questions in there. Um, and while we give a uh, great question from Robert, actually, I don't know if the 29th is a Friday, Jamie, we'll have to double check that uh, our calendars, but the 29th is the next uh, webinar from 12 to 1. Um, and so uh, please come back for that. Um, but does anyone have any questions, please? Uh, it is a Wednesday. Yes, thank you. Um, please use the Q&A function. Um, but maybe a first question more generally, because it's very clear that the question of what is research data sounds very simple, but as you clearly outlined here, um, it's, you know, there's so much to think about. And so one question we have is, uh, what is the difference between research data management and archives? Oh, I like that question. Okay, so um, there's different ways of thinking about that. Research data management is sort of a new, um, uh, way of thinking about how we manage our research data specifically. So data that we're working with for research purposes. We're thinking about not just the preservation side um, where, where archives is uh, first and foremost thinking about the preservation and archiving. Whereas research data management is thinking about the full life cycle of um, your research data. So um, how are you collecting it? How are you storing it while you're working with it, actively working with it? Um, how are you sharing it with others, such as your research team? Um, how are you depositing it and then archiving it potentially for the longer term? Uh, whereas archives, um, the like I said, the, and I, an archivist would be able to explain this way better than I am, but my understanding of, of archives is um, is archiving uh, records, you know, any kind of sort of um, archive, uh, archival record um, uh, for the longer term. And they're thinking about the same things that we are when we're thinking and talking about research data management. Uh, but research data management, uh, the, the, the sole focus is on, uh, on research data and, and how you're managing your data and accessing your data. Hopefully that helps clarify it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you're right. The distinctions are 
they kind of blur the lines, but uh, like in practice, there's a, there's kind of some distinctions for sure. Um, I have a specific question uh, about file naming uh, like Camelback, uh, which uh, the question kind of uh, explains that uh, Camelback uses complete wordings separated by capitalization instead of spaces. Uh, and the question is kind of wondering what your thoughts are on processes like these. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I honestly can't say whether I know uh, whether capitalization is good practice or not. As far as I know, capitalization, there's no issue with it. When we're thinking about file naming, we're thinking about how is the computer going to sort that file? So it, uh, avoiding uh, wording se separation by spaces is definitely good practice. Um, but if you're using capitalization that should be fine. Um, I'd be interested to learn to, to to look more into that in terms of best practice, um, whether capitalization really matters. My sense is that it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, so we have two questions uh, coming in. One is about storing and one is about sharing data. Uh, so the first one is um, uh, there, this, Question asker is Mandy, and Mandy's interested to know if you have any recommendations on where to store files digitally in Canada. Some storage sites that come to mind are Dropbox, Sync, Microsoft OneDrive, et cetera. Is there one that you'd recommend over another? Uh, another great question. So um, there's a ton of platforms out there, paid for platforms, free platforms. Um, you really have to decide on what makes sense for you uh, and, and your organization or your research project or research team. Um, so thinking about things like Dropbox, if your data is sensitive data, uh, Dropbox mo most likely is storing their data. They're a public platform and they're storing their, uh, their data in the United States. Um, and it's not locally stored in Canada. It's not on Canadian servers. So if that's important, to you, um, then you might want to find a platform that um, is uh, storing data more locally or at least nationally in Canada. Um, uh, there are some resources available through uh, organizations like Compute Canada, which um, does offer uh, storage space to Canadian scholars and um, in some cases, research organizations outside of the universities who are looking for uh, storage on Canadian servers, so secure storage. Another thing to think about is um, what's the privacy policy or user agreement with that um, the, the platform you, you're looking at uses, so Dropbox or Google. Um, you know, they're pretty, pretty standardized across those platforms, but at least looking at the uh, uh, privacy policy um, is, is a good indication of uh, whether it's secure enough for the kind of data that you're working with. Amazing. Uh, and thanks everyone for your great questions. We've got a bunch coming in, which is really exciting. Um, Trish uh, Fitzpatrick uh, did note here that um, in the chat that uh, capitalization is very important for those who are visually impaired. So uh, thinking about capitalizing words in a file name that's kind of all squished together is a good practice. Um, for that, uh, but also, you know, important for file organization generally. So thanks, Trish, for your, for your comments there. Um, the other question that we had here about uh, data sharing is, uh, what is the best medium to share data in a secure way with someone like an advisor? Um, what medium? Oh, yeah, like what's the best medium to share right. data in a secure way? Yeah. Let's see. Um, okay, so that would be so if it's sensitive data, um, thinking about um, how you're sharing your data, whether it's uh, over email or over um, a platform like like Dropbox or um, a a a, um, a more secure um, zip file that might be encrypted. So thinking about uh, encryption when it comes to um, sharing sensitive data. Uh, it may not be just the platform to think about, but things like um, how is this data file protected? Is it password protected? Is it encrypted? Um, those are the kinds of questions that you'll want to ask. So uh, avoiding just sending something over email 
Um, you can encrypt uh, an individual file over email. In fact, um, I'm just going to share. The university has a resource that everyone can access. And it's sort of a data security uh, FAQ that answers some of these questions. Hopefully I can find it. Uh, so some questions to ask about whether um, your data is encrypted or um, password protected, and then how you might actually encrypt your file before you're sharing it across a platform or across email. Yeah, Nextcloud was mentioned in the chat. So Nextcloud is only available to uh, University of Winnipeg um, uh, staff and faculty, um, but that is a platform that that uh, is also offered actually by Compute Canada. So a research organization such as uh, uh, those that are attending today um, might uh, might contact Compute Canada and ask for um, a uh, an account for for Nextcloud, which is similar to Dropbox, but the data storage is, is on, on Canadian servers. Okay, thank you so much, Jamie. Um, another question that we have is uh, thinking about old data. So how can we think about transferring um, and storing old data like cassettes, CD-ROMs? Um, how, how do we think about transferring them and storing them digitally? Uh, that's a great question. I think the first thing to think about is um, actually digi digitizing or um, converting those files uh, to a format that is going to be a little bit longer lasting. Um, organizations will have data in all kinds of formats like CD-ROMs and cassettes. So um, thinking through a process of converting those to um, a audio or, or visual file for preservation and then and then um, sharing it. So um, those are the kinds of questions you'll want to ask when working with old data is can we even convert it? What technology do we need to convert it? You might need a special machine, uh, for example, to convert an old CD-ROM to a audio um, file these days. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat or in the Q&A. Oh, perfect timing. Uh, so we just got another one. So uh, the question here is, uh, is there still a best practice for legacy formats that need to stay physical? So thinking about microfiche or other uh, formats that, um, you know, not necessarily just turning them into digital and storing them, but, uh, you know, best practices for keeping the physical versions too. Yeah, there definitely are um, best practices for um, what type of um, uh, temperature they're stored at, um, best practices for what type of material they're stored in. Um, and that's all, um, you know, uh, honestly, something I'm new to. Archivists are the experts uh, in that realm of the actual physical uh, sort of analog data, but that's still part of research data management is you, if you have and want to preserve analog data um, like um, uh, microfiche, then uh, we, we do need to think about how we're preserving those for the long term. Uh, whether digital, digitization is an option too, um, don't discount um, converting those files, but if that isn't an option, then um, I don't have any resources offhand, but um, I can think about that and uh, bring something to the, the next webinar about um, preserving um, uh, physical physical data formats. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we got another really interesting question about um, when thinking about naming uh, files and kind of keeping a system that uh, is followed long term. Um, but also wondering uh, this question is wondering how you can ensure that multiple team members name and store de data in the same way um, when it's not just one person who's gathering and collecting and storing data, but um, what tips do you have about, you know, ensuring kind of across a team that there's consistency? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, developing some basic procedures, it doesn't have to be complicated, some just sort of basic rules of, of how we're going to name and save files, providing examples, 
and uh, making sure that the team or the organization um, knows where to find that information. So if you have a shared drive, for example, or um, uh, or just one person that has that ha that delegates that information out, um, making sure that that it's available to everyone in the organization and that it's and simple and um, straightforward for everyone to follow. Uh, so standardizing it across the, the organization is, um, is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we have time for maybe one more question. If there's any final uh, points that anyone wants to drop into the chat or the Q&A. I think maybe while I, I wait just a few more minutes for somebody to do that, I just want to mention to everyone uh, before you leave uh, that, uh, again, to remind you to fill out the post webinar survey that will be sent around uh, as it's going to be the one of the ways to help inform the development of the toolkit that's being developed. Um, definitely, please sign up for future webinars in this series uh, and on the you can see all of the, the series list on the near website under news. Um, and I did want to mention too that uh, those who attend all six of the webinars will receive a certificate of completion for this training. So that can be a, a benefit to you if you're able to attend all six webinars. Um, and seeing no additional questions, I think I'll just finally remind everyone again, the next webinar, as Jamie mentioned, is September 29th. Uh, from 12 to 1, and we're going to be moving from what is research data to what is research data management, so kind of the next step there. Um, thank you so much, Larissa. There's information in the chat uh, about the, the webinar series. Um, and thank you so much again, Jamie, for your time and your expertise uh, and for everything that you, you've brought for us here today. Thanks so much. Thanks for all your questions, everyone, and for uh, coming today.